thank you, uh, Housing X. Congratulations. It's really great. Um, the topic, the speakers, I don't know about you guys, I, I've been really engaged. Um, it's exciting. Um, I just am wondering how you're feeling now with your organizations. Are you like, yeah, I can do all this? I'm ready to integrate, you know, off-site housing? The demographic shift, are you ready to, your organization going to make that shift? You know, um, the incandescent light bulb was invented in 1879, Thomas Edison. Who can guess how long it took for those incandescent light bulbs to come into our homes? Guess. Throw a number. 50, 50 20, 5. Okay, it took 40 years before the incandescent light bulb actually became, had impact really in our communities. Why is that relevant? All these innovative ideas we're hearing are wonderful, right? But what really matters is how ideas move to action, and they move quickly. These are adaptive organizations, as I would call it. Organizations that can look at an innovative idea and move it to action. Not just action, but actually get impact. It's not an easy um, endeavor. The John Cotter in his work in Leading Change highlights that only about 30% of the organizations who are going to actually make transformational major shifts. So if you're a housing organization and you're going to start doing off-site, you know, that's a pretty big shift. Only about 30% succeed. It used to be 10%, by the way, not long ago. <laughs> so that means there's something that's been learned here. Um, so adaptive organizations matter and how you and your, your team shifts is truly important. The questions I like to explore here is, one, what are the characteristics of an adaptive, adaptive organization? And two, what are the practices? Because I personally believe that every organization can be an adaptive organization. Just because they fail, we heard earlier today, failure is good, right? Agile development, we've heard of that in the software industry, guys, right? That's all about rapid, I'm in Boulder, we have all these high tech, Folks, I have these buddies, it's amazing. They talk about all this money spent and how they fail on their 30-day sprint. There is an adaptive change we've got to think about. How do we foster that idea of experimentation, learning, and moving forward? I do believe every one of your organizations can be an adaptive, successful organization. So let's talk about the characteristics of uh, an adaptive organization, an innovative organization. So give me a word or two. How would you describe uh, an innovative organization? Word or two. Flexible. Flexible. Dynamic. Dynamic. Forward thinking. Action-oriented. Action-oriented. Great. Collaborative. Collaborative. Fearless. Fearless. I love it. Risk tolerant. Great. Persevering. Persevering. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, you know, the context laid out by Deb, and then also we heard Noah too, this idea of creativity and the challenging times we're in. So the context matters, right? And these characteristics that we see, maybe it's our organization or or, or a parent or or other organizations really shed light on and help us to see kind of aspects maybe of our organization that may need to shift, right? So it's good to have that idea. Let's hold that thought. Um, I'm hoping he can get this to work soon. Um, but I'm going to roll. When I was thinking of characteristics, I thought of, well, a very a highly successful uh, insect, yes, an insect that has adapted and thrived. One of the first flying insects to evolve over 300 million years ago, it's not a test, the dragonfly. Why the dragonfly? I think there's three characteristics that to me really stand out. One, vision. I don't know if you're aware of this. I really wasn't until I dug into it, so. Um, they have two eyes. That's not, nothing radical. They're two compound eyes with thousands of lenses. They have a 360 degree range of view. 
perspective, right? Now think of your organization, right? An, an adaptive organization that moves ideas to action to results with perspective, right? By the way, they have two eyes, so they can focus just like we can. Amazing. It really is. They're nimble. For all you drone lovers out there, this is the creature to emulate. They can hover like a hummingbird mid-air. They can spin, they can drop, they can go sideways. Right? Agile. We just, I just talked about agile companies. Two, you know, think about the third component that really jumps out at me is um, with the dragonfly is they're fast. They're fast. They can travel at 60 kilometers per hour. That's relevant, I, I believe, for an adaptive organization to succeed. Windows of opportunity in times of change open and close. Who here recalls when the federal government had stimulus money and they had all this money out there for what? Energy improvements. Who capitalized on that? Who moved quickly on that? If you didn't, you probably lost out, right? So speed does matter. Um, so the question then becomes, how can you get there from where you're operating now? I don't think there's any one way. Just like we're all unique individuals, so are organizations. And so we, and you heard earlier, we try and go to a mode of linear thinking about how to move our organizations forward. I just need a business plan. If I get a business plan, then I can achieve these results. In times of change, that does not work. That's part of the failure rate, right? So, so how do you do it? Well, there's certain practices. I think we can look to the folks who've succeeded in moving innovative ideas to action to results. And so I want to highlight a few of those. Um, the cornerstone to me is the idea of exercising leadership. This should um, resonate from previous speakers today, right? Um, you can say, well, what the heck is that? <laughs> well, I love Marty Linsky's um, frame on this one. Exercising leadership is when you help others to bridge the gap between the current reality and your aspiration. Bridge the gap, right? Helping others to bridge the gap between your current reality and your aspiration. Okay, so, okay, that's great. That sounds good, Roger. <laughs> so what, that doesn't, that doesn't tell me much. So we're gonna dig into each of those components in a second, but I wanna just flesh out this idea of why the failure is there. Like, why is it so hard for us to do that? Um, and the root of that is our success. Yep, our success. Who here builds single family homes? Okay, single family home production. So think of your organization, your culture, you have what? Staff, contractors, subs. You have a way of working, right? And I'm gonna make a number up just to keep us rolling, but let's just say your average home size is 1,500 square feet. You just heard that tiny homes are in. What, it's gonna, what would your team say if you walk back in the office tomorrow and say, you know what? We're going to shift from 1,500 square foot homes to seven. How would they respond? What's your guess? Crazy. You're crazy. That's not in the budget. Not, it's not in the budget. Okay. What was that, Marion? What did you say? They'd be cursing. They'd be cursing. Ah, there you go. Now we're getting some candor here. <laughs> yeah, it's resistance to change. Behavior change is difficult. Think about yourself. If someone tells you to do something different and you're used to doing it, you say, well, wait a minute. No, you know what? I need cream in my coffee. I'm not drinking it without it. Okay? So let's just be clear. We're talking about asking people who work a certain way, and it could be yourselves and ourselves, to shift how they work. That is uncomfortable, and you're going to get resistance. That's why the linear approach doesn't work. So when you are moving an innovative idea to action, to results, you've got to lead. You can't manage it. But what makes this even more difficult is your business model's in place, so you build these 1,500 square foot homes, right? And now you're saying build them differently. Well, you still gotta build the 1,500 square foot homes. You got 20 homes in the pipeline. So you have to lead and manage, and they're different, and they both have to be done, and they both have to be done well, or it's hard to succeed. Adaptive organizations 
right? Move innovative ideas to action and results by leading and managing. That's exercising leadership. So, so let's explore the components of that from two that I just talked to you about. The idea of the current reality, right? And, and filling the gap. To me, um, the concept I like is the balcony. Balcony matters. It's critical. Actually, we heard of it today, right? With Noah and his creativity. You're saying, well, how do I get more creative? Balcony. You've got to get on the balcony. You've got to step out of the weeds. If that dragonfly is down in the marsh and in the weeds, do you think that that advantage they have with vision is there? No. If you're always in the weeds with day-to-day -day operations, not making space for yourself to rise up and survey what's going on in your organization, you're at a disadvantage. And by the way, this is a discipline and you have to consciously think about it. If you're a type A, you're gonna say, well, Roger, I can't do that, I don't have enough time, right? I would claim you don't have enough time not to do this. Change is happening so fast. You've gotta create the space to do this. Adaptive organizations that have succeeded, from my experience, have really not just created balcony space for the individuals leading change, they build it into the organization up and down, right? What I mean by that is I take an hour and I take my phone up ahead and I put it on the floor, right? Yes, we've got to take the, all that input we're getting and we've got to quiet that and think about what's going on with us. What are we hearing? What are we seeing, right? And digest that. What's that going to do? It's going to help us clarify the current reality because it's changing quickly. It's no longer just okay to do that when you do strategic planning. Who does that? Strategic planning, right? We do that then, right? Otherwise, move. Or, oh, no, no, we do it when we do the annual budget, and that's enough. Those are really obsolete models. I'm not saying those aren't needed. You need those. We need a strategic direction, but we need a different discipline and how we create space. Could you start your day off without opening your email and looking at your phone and give yourself 30 minutes, 15, 20 minutes just to reflect? How are you doing? What do I need to do differently this week to achieve, to achieve my strategic goals for the month? There you go, that's a starter, right? That's balcony. Balcony matters. That's the perspective of the dragonfly. You gotta create that. It's not just gonna happen. By the way, by creating that, you get that creative space which we heard about earlier today. So that is the balcony. I think the second part is, you know, it's fine, but uh, the organizations that are successfully moving new products forward, innovative ideas, also, I, have really have a very powerful sense of direction and what success looks like. Simple question. Sometimes we take it for granted, but we've really got to be crystal clear that of defining what that means. So let's go back to the single family home construction example. If I were to walk in the room with all of Marion's staff and say, okay, we're going to build 700 square foot homes. They're going to say, yeah, right, you know, like you said, Roger, you, you know, we got 10 homes to build in the next six months, I'll talk to you later, right? I have to take on, it's my job, if I'm messaging to Marion's team, it's my job to actually get buy-in. It's not their issue, it's mine. And the way I've got to start with that is by looking at what success looks like and communicating that in a different way. And we have huge needs. We have these demographic shifts going on in our community. We have older folks. They like to live closer together. They don't have much money. We want to build some smaller homes. Well, tell me more, Roger. Um, and so you've got to look at defining clear outcomes. You've heard this. this you're hearing, I'm sure you've looked at this with SMART goals. This is where SMART goals and outcomes live. You've got to dare to be very specific and clear about what success looks like and listen for feedback as your teams embrace this. Oh, wait, hey, we got slides. See, oh wait, see, I gotta show the artwork, see? <laughs> I do believe art matters. I have this up on purpose. I think you've got to start using creativity and artists, not just putting it in a project, but how do you use it to manage? An organization I've worked with actually has an artist as a lead on their team. This is artwork for my wife. Um, so, Balcony matters, success matters. Let me pull it forward. Support matters. Um, yeah, even the dragonfly will lose a wing. All right, so, so you need the right team. 
So leadership is about motivation, right? So if you go into, if I go in back to Project Homes construction team and I say, hey guys, we're doing these homes, you have to do them. Joe, I want you over here and you're here. We're going to build five of these homes. I'm clear with my outcomes, but I'm just saying, okay, you're going to do that. What are they going to say? They're building 20 homes already. They're already working 40 plus hours a week and you're, ask, you're telling them to do more. That's managing, right? So how you build a team helps to push this in the right direction, helps to move the innovative idea to action to results. And that is by motivating, inspiring. You share your success story, you find the right skills, you line the right skill set up with what you need, and you recruit that person. Yes, it's on you. It's not on them to jump on your bus. This is leading. And this is the kind of support you need to move this forward. By the way, um, if you're trying to do it within this existing line of business, that may not work. So I also found, you heard us spoken to earlier, this idea of silos. You actually, typically I've seen um, innovations move forward with independent, unique teams that are assembled just for that project, a stereotype. And then they bring everyone along, right? So you've got to think out of the box here. Um, and I want to kind of close with loving critics. Yes, loving critics. Um, I'll tell that from a personal story. Um, I am a graduate of the Achieving Excellence program, so I was um, leading a, a nonprofit organization and joined Bob Newman and a bunch of peers. And I really think this has got to be called out. Um, when you're leading change, you're exercising leadership, you're going to get what? Pulled? Forces are going to pull you back to the day-to-day -day management piece, right? It's normal. That's what happens. It's hard to stay, get on that balcony. Having loving critics, folks who understand where you're going, can give you positive feedback, can help you move through that in a very independent way. Not your spouse, right? That, that, that's nice. Your spouse can give you nice feedback. But I'm talking about a, a team of folks that you maybe go to coffee with, but you have it in a more structured way, can really help you move through, think through problems, right? Um, and this is in theory, so I'll, I'll provide three examples of uh, structured, living, uh, loving kind of critics that have been highly successful. One is Achieving Excellence, I share with you. That's a national program by Networks America. Two is the Sustainable Home Ownership Project, now the Sustainable Business Initiative, which is another Networks initiative. Network is, Networks is moving everything there. They, they assemble groups, they have peer groups, and they're moving forward with that structure. Um, and thirdly is a new one we've created here in Virginia, the Nonprofit Sustainability Challenge. 20 groups, a bunch of folks in here have been part of that. Um, you should talk to them. It's amazing what you can hear from your peers when you're trying to make change and you, know, you can't just talk to your peer you work with, right? Because maybe it's about them that you need to chat with them. But if you have a loving critic, you can get there. So that is uh, kind of the idea of support matters. I'll just close with this. We can do one or two things. Look to get on the balcony. How can you create balcony space? When you leave today, you can move to be an adaptive organization. You can bring new ideas right, to action. How can you create balcony time? How can you define your gap or redefine it with your team between the reality and the future that you want? And thirdly, listen. You know, maybe connect with your, the people you serve in a different way. If you're a leader, spend time with your staff. Listen, just listen. And by the way, if you're the front desk person, then Go connect with the CEO. Out of the box, listening matters. Thank you. <laughs>